Well, good morning and welcome to our service of morning prayer and happy Easter, everyone. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Christ our Passover, alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once, for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. A reading from Psalms 108, 18. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tent of the righteousness. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has come. I should not die but live 
and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me surely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted, we will rejoice and be glad in it. A reading from Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 34. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us, who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness? awesome in renown, and worker of wonders. You stretch forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love, you led the people to be redeemed. With your might, you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession, the resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold, fir hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as the first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even bound to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all the people most to be pitied. But if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. After he has destroyed every ruler and every authority, authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song of the Lamb. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain. For with your blood you have redeemed for God, from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so, to him who sits upon the throne, and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and forevermore. Amen. according to John. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth 
that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they had laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Jesus made a number of astounding claims in this life. In Mark's Gospel, he calls himself the Son of Man. Now, this is significant because this was a reference to the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7, in which the Son of Man has authority, glory, and sovereign power and is worshipped by all nations. It says in Daniel, the Son of Man will come at the end of time to judge all people and rule forever. So, pretty amazing claim. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And it says the religious leaders picked up stones to stone him because they believed that Jesus was making a claim of divinity. In another place, Jesus claims to be the only way to a relationship with God the Father. These are bold and astounding claims to make. Now, it's true that any person alive can make any kind of claim they want to make. Any person on earth right now can claim to be the divine Son of God. And there have been plenty of people over the years who have made such claims. The question is, what evidence is there to support the fact that Jesus backed up the extraordinary claims he made about himself by rising from the dead? on that first Easter Sunday. Author and pastor Dr. Tim Keller writes this in his book, The Reason for God. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Philosophy professor from Boston College and theologian Dr. Peter Kreef points out every sermon preached in the New Testament centers on the resurrection. Kreef says the message that flashed across the ancient world set hearts on fire 
changed lives and turned the world upside down was not love your neighbor. Every morally sane person already knew that. It was not news. The news was that a man who claimed to be the son of God and savior of the world had risen from the dead. It was this very unlikely message that the early church took out to the world. And it was for this unlikely message that they were willing to die. Now, there are three possibilities. Number one, the disciples were lying. They knew Jesus died and stayed dead. But for whatever reason, they got together and decided that they'd lie and tell people that he had risen. Number two, the story of the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus on that first Easter Sunday was true. Or number three, as some have claimed in recent times, the story of the resurrection was not intended to be taken as literally true at all. But rather, the disciples intended this incredible story to be taken as a metaphor for new life and new possibility. The question is, what fits the facts? And before we get there, I want to deal with one issue right up front. Some people will say, well, of course people at that time in the first century A.D. would believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That kind of belief was common back then. So these people say it's no big surprise that the disciples would say something like this. But the problem is, that's simply not true. So allow me to lay it out. Jesus was, of course, Jewish. The first disciples were Jewish, but not all Jews believe the same thing about what happens after we die. One main group, the Pharisees, believed that you die and then at the end of time, there would be a bodily resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. We can see this spoken of by the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. The Sadducees, another significant group within Judaism, did not believe in the afterlife at all. They were not atheists, far from it. They believed in God. They just believed that when you die, you're dead. And that's the end of things. There's nothing more. In the Roman culture of the first century in which Jesus lived, many believed that what was important was not your body, but your spirit. And so life was kind of this struggle for the spirit to be free from the body. So in the end, your spirit lives on, but the body is left behind to become part of the earth. And so here's the key. What we need to realize is that what the disciples were saying happened to Jesus fits none of these categories. It was absolutely unique. They were saying not that Jesus will experience a bodily resurrection at the end of time with a whole lot of people, but that he rose individually in the midst of time, on the third day after his death. So first of all, let's consider the various accounts of the empty tomb and the sightings of the risen Lord. Where do they come from? And what are, the, what are some of the things we know about these accounts? Well, what we have, in fact, are multiple independent accounts from different sources written at different times and in different places. These independent accounts were drawn together and included in what we know today as our New Testament. Some accounts are found in the Gospels. One resurrection account is found in one of Paul's letters that you heard read earlier from Debbie in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, some have made the claim that you can't trust these accounts as reliable because they were being written long after the events they described. But this is simply not true. In fact, Mark's gospel was written perhaps 30 to 35 years after Jesus' death. And his material was from oral sources dated much earlier. 1 Corinthians 15 
which is Paul's account of the resurrection, was written in the early to mid-50s AD, but even some of the most progressive scholars today admit that the portion about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 came about as early as a year or two after the events it describes. So perhaps as early as about 30 AD. And here it is. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And so we have Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15, and we have the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all writing about the resurrection. And the significant thing here is that these were eyewitness accounts, or they were relaying firsthand accounts of the resurrection. As Paul said, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then to more than 500 of the brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the people alive and present at the time of the resurrection were mostly still around when he wrote this letter. And what he was saying really is if you think I'm making all of this up, there are plenty of people who were around when this happened. So you can check it out with them. However, there is no record of any person ever coming forward to say, hey, it didn't happen the way the disciples are saying it happened. What we discover is that each gospel writer has a slightly different perspective on the resurrection. They're different because they saw different things. They noticed different things. Now, I believe this speaks to the fact that there was no effort on the part of the disciples or the early church to line up their story perfectly so that they would all appear to be saying exactly the same thing. So in other words, the differences in the resurrection accounts speak to their credibility. You know, one common element is that they all agree that the tomb was found empty on that first Easter Sunday. In fact, even the enemies of Jesus testified that the tomb was empty. The location of the tomb was well known, not only to Jesus' disciples, but to the Romans and the Jews. And so all they'd have to do to silence the disciples as they went out stirring up trouble by saying a dead man who claimed to be the Messiah and Son of God had risen to life was to produce a body. They'd cart it out and say, here it is, so shut your mouth. But Jesus' dead body was never produced. Next, the Gospels all agree that it was the women who were the first witnesses of the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday. Now, this is compelling because women were viewed as unreliable witnesses in that first century male-dominated culture. The testimony of women was not even permitted in a court of law. So this is not something you'd want to include if you want people to believe your story. Unless, of course, that's the way it happened and the story is true. Next, we need to consider the changed lives of the disciples. And the fact that they were willing to suffer and die because of their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Now think about it. During Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and death, what is the emotional state of the disciples? The disciples are described as scared. They're described as cowering behind closed and locked doors. Some, like Peter, are denying that they even know Jesus. And then all of a sudden, 
there's this dramatic change. These same disciples who just days earlier are depressed, discouraged, and despondent are now out risking their very lives to proclaim that Jesus is alive. The key question is what explains it? What short of the resurrection of Jesus can explain this total transformation? Consider this, people lie about things all the time. Why do people lie? Well, they do because they believe that they'll get some benefit from telling a particular lie. There's always some perceived benefit when a person tells a lie. Think about it. If the disciples are lying about the resurrection, there is absolutely no benefit. Here's what they get for sharing this incredible and unlikely story about the resurrection. They get persecuted, beaten, stoned, beheaded, boiled in vats of oil, and martyred. Hardly great incentive to tell a lie, wouldn't you say? And finally, one message that some have taken hold of in recent years is that the disciples didn't intend for people to believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead at all. Some say resurrection was simply a metaphor for new possibilities and new hope. Somehow, after Jesus' death, the disciples' hearts were strangely warmed. They were reinvigorated and re-energized by a sense of the Spirit of Jesus moving in their midst. But they didn't mean for people to take the story of Jesus rising from the dead literally. The problem is, that's not what the disciples said. Their message was that Jesus died a real death on that first Good Friday and rose literally bodily from the grave on that first Easter Sunday. Thomas, one of the 12, was a doubter, a skeptic. Now, he wasn't around when Jesus first appeared on that first Easter Sunday. And so he said to the others, unless I put my fingers in the nail marks in his hands and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Men and women, Thomas wasn't transformed from a skeptic to a fearless disciple willing to risk his life for the Lord because his heart was strangely warmed by a metaphor. No, Jesus invited him to touch his resurrected body. And as a result, he made perhaps the greatest proclamation of faith in the entire New Testament. He said, my Lord and my God. A metaphor doesn't walk with the disciples down a road and talk with them. A metaphor doesn't eat broiled fish. A metaphor never changed anyone's life. The glorious message of that first Easter is that Jesus is alive, really, truly, literally. And because he is God's great reclamation project, has begun. Death is defeated. Our sins are forgiven. Jesus is who he says he is, and there is real hope for every person who is alive, for everyone who trusts in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
together, let's say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Together, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. Let us pray. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grant us, O Lord, a sense of your comforting presence for our residents and staff. Our community continues to deal with uncertainty and anxiety during this time. And we know that your perfect love casts out all fear and brings a peace that passes all understanding. We ask for that peace and for your wisdom today. We pray that still hopes will continue to be a haven of peace, of health and body, mind and spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Reading from our chapel prayer list. This week we pray for the Church of Pakistan. And we pray for the Church of the Resurrection in Greenwood and the ministry of altar guilt. We also pray for the people of Ukraine. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you Carolyn Hardy and Harry Parker at their death, that their death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. And we pray for Carolyn and Harry and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And may their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. We pray for Retta Miller, Marcine Thompson, Jane Moorfield, Tommy Gregory, Martha Helen King, John Condy, Anne Reed, Jim Martin, Canty Hale,
Frank Ellerby, Nelson Weston, Sarah Parker, Chubby Rice, Margaret Wang, and Doug Lomas. We pray for the safety of our military, remembering especially Brian Deacon, Edward and Katie Floyd, Alexander and Isaac White, and Natalie White. And this coming week, we celebrate birthdays of Elizabeth Atkinson, Sue Shoons, Carrie Bonner, Robert Hill, Linda Dickinson, Ella DeBose, and Joan Moss. Together, let's pray the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. May we pray. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And happy Easter to everyone. Mm -hmm.